What's up, listeners and supporters of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast? We need some help from you, and it won't take up too much of your time. As we grow, we always want to hear your feedback, so take a minute or two to fill out a short, anonymous survey. The survey link is right in the episode notes for this podcast. It's easy and takes less than five minutes. As always, we thank you for your continued support. Hard to Tell Podcast, episode 180. Dexter Henry, Brian Fonseca here. Shoot. Brian's here. New book is out. He'll doggo heights. That's right. Go get that right now. You see, I got it right here. You know I got my book. Yeah. If you're listening, you won't see this, but it's right behind me. We're moving. Stand of Move, stuff. Moving some copies, and we haven't even uh, posted the, uh, well, we haven't even like went full sort of uh full go on the promo yet. So I'm excited to see that. Meaning, you know, I haven't uh I haven't done any press or whatever yet, but that's starting soon. How how does it feel? I gotta ask you this as we start, because the book is out, came out uh June first. How does it feel to be self published uh author <laughs> right now? Independent author, how does it feel? Because now now it's real. Now it's out there. Fucking relieved. I was very like I was very I had anxiety going up to the day. You know what I mean? And just throughout the whole process and like, you know, trying to make sure the edits were good, trying to make sure I didn't have any like, you know, super bad typos or whatever and like super obvious ones, you know what I mean? Or or just very uh, obvious inconsistencies. And if there are any that I overlooked, you know, DM me, let me know. But as far as I can tell, like we 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 got it right to where it should be. But that shit is very, uh, you know, it's, it's the same thing as working on a video project for X amount of time. And then you want to make sure that every detail is as good as possible. And in the end, maybe you look back two years later, be like, oh, I could have did this better. I missed this or whatever. But, you know, I feel like it was uh, my best effort and not my only one. You know, there will be more coming. So I don't know. No, if yeah. I don't think there's not going to be any more this year. This is going to be it for this year. But, you know, if 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 I could sort of uh, figure out this whole work-life balance thing I've been working on, which we're going to get into a little bit later, you know, maybe one or two more next year, and uh, including, look, including look, the look at you. this. Look at you. You sound like the, the rapper <laughs> teasing his, his next album. No, nah, I don't, don't know when you're going to get it. <laughs> Might get it next year. Might have a couple projects for you next year. You I, got a, I, mean? I got a couple of ideas I really like. I will say this, though. Like, I, you know, the next... Because it's usually people, uh, you know, drop one a year, one every two years. One every two years is really the norm in book world, I've come to realize. But, I, you know, I have a couple of ideas, one of which I'm already working on, which is the sequel to this. And, you know, that obviously, you know, I want people to react to this one first. So I don't want to get too far ahead. But, I'm, you know, people will know that there's a sequel. And you'll know re- reading it once you get to the end, like, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, this has to have a continuation. So yeah, yeah I, I have I have not read it yet. I'm going to start it uh, later this week. Uh, but I did. Brian told me to open up the first page, and I did see. And Brian had a list of people he he thanked. But what I loved about it was, and if you get the book, as you should, it was it was in typical Brian fashion. Brian had a nice th- uh, thank you to me at, at the top that I I, I appreciated uh, in terms of the help for inspiration and, and motivation to to you know to do this um yeah. but brian knows how i feel about independent content creation and especially for and i spoke about this on the last podcast especially for people who look like us so you know i'm very proud to have supported the book that i was going to do and yeah. others others we know other friends and family i've seen supporting the book so like i said go get that copy of, of hidalgo heights I wanted to say that off the top uh before we get into and i also would like to add um in terms of independent work Last week, uh, this happened after we recorded the podcast, I found out that I had uh, won a Telly Award mm, for right. uh, Sideline Story Sports Voices Matter. Uh, I think it's a huge award uh, for, for all of us. We've won some really great awards in the past year, myself and Brian, for some stuff we've done on Sideline Stories, including our piece, La Cultura. But for this one in particular that I did during the pandemic, Brian talked about the work we did during the pandemic, uh, working on other things. So I was really happy about that. Uh, it was a, a bronze uh, award, uh, but to be among other pl- people like ESPN, Vice, uh, some of the great sports 
documentary folks that are making good stuff out there, just to be among those names and to win an award independently uh, was great. I think what mattered a lot to me about that is uh, the people I used to work for. They also put me up for a, uh, a telly award, but I didn't win it with them. I won it independently <laughs> on my own, doing my own thing. And it's truly amazing what you can do when you tell, have innovative and in-depth storytelling. Those are words said by my homie, Christina Carrega, who said that there. Truly amazing. Key words there, innovative and in-depth. Key words there. But no, it's, it's, it, it was really great to do it. And I think it's independent journalist. Uh, in terms of what they can do. So, you know, I'm really proud of that award and uh, look, looking forward to doing doing some more things. We got a lot of other good things that's, that's cooking. But let's get into sports. Uh, time mm-hmm. we're dropping this on Thursday uh, is after the Knicks season ended uh, following their Game 5 loss to the Atlanta Hawks. I was in the building. First time I had been at a sporting event in, ooh, I can't even remember, quite some time. Uh, even as a fan, it had been or, or media, it had been quite some time to be in a building with a bunch of other people. But I was at Madison Square Garden for Game Five. Unfortunately, the Knicks lost. Uh, but it was a really, it was a really great experience. It was great to be back in the building. It was great to be next to fans who were vaccinated. It was absolutely great to enjoy that, be part of that space. I went with my best, one of my best friends, uh, who's a diehard Knicks fan as well, and it was just fun. And look. You're already getting talk from people, Brian. I was talking about this before we got on. Oh, the, the, the Knicks disappointed. They didn't win again. As if anybody expected them to win this year. Shout out to our man, Jamal Murphy, who rocks with us on NBA Picks and Props every week, who said, of course the Knicks season is a success. The Knicks won, <laughs> projected their over-under was 22 and a half wins. And they won 41 games. And they lost in the first round of playoffs. They had home court advantage. And now it's not a success. Nobody expects any for the Knicks. Even me, who expected the Knicks to be over the 22 wins, I had them at like 28, 41. It's, it, they were 19 above what they were projected to do. And many people even project them to do less than the 22. So how can that be a success? Look, this was a season that nobody expected. I didn't expect. I think even the most uh, high-expectation Knicks fan that might be a little irrational didn't expect this. And does the team have deficiencies that they overachieve? Yes. Do they have grown to do? Yes. But I think the thing that as, as as watching the team that I feel like all fans should be excited for going forward is they built a culture. Tom Thibodeau set the culture. I don't know if Tom Thibodeau is the coach that's going to take them to that next level. I don't think they have all the players that have them right at that next level. But a culture and foundation of competence has been set. When's the last time any Nick fan could say that? They look competent, like a competent organization. They made smart moves, picking up Derrick Rose. They haven't mortgaged the future. The owner stayed out of the way. It sounds, seems like a pretty good start to me. Um, I wouldn't be too, too mad about it. I think there's room to grow. I think the future could, could be bright. I think a lot of it has to do with the ownership staying out the way and letting the management and the people who've been running things this way do what they got to do. But I don't see how you could look at this season – any way other than being successful. If you just say that it's not successful and you want to be a, you know, you want to troll and be a hater, like I get it if that's your thing. But this next season, it was enjoyable to me. I think these are the seasons as a fan, you've got to enjoy. Like if you really enjoy the process of things, then you have to enjoy it. This was a season where there's no pressure, no expectations for you to win. You just enjoy, you're seeing young players develop. You're seeing the team build a culture. It's fun. I had fun watching it. Like, That's it. It doesn't have to be about everything else. It's hard to win a championship. It's hard to win in the NBA. Sometimes you can just enjoy the process of being on the come up before you then get to the warm up, before you get to the blow up. And then, you know, maybe eventually you win a championship. Maybe. Brian, did you enjoy this next season? I I see what you did there. Uh, Shout out to J. Cole. Um, (laughs) I think that it was a great season for the Knicks and their fans. I think that you know, the, the the thing that is sort of dispiriting in terms of the end of it is two major factors, right? One, the officiating in the playoffs overall in every series has been inconsistent, but in this one in particular was probably worse than the others. Um, Trey Young fishing for calls in the playoffs and like, you know, that does matter in terms of how a game could swing 
and how you know guys have to try to defend him by not doing certain things, and then he's able to get to his spots quicker. And I think that that sort of distorted the Knicks' defense at times, even though their defense largely wasn't that bad throughout the series and kept them in a lot of games. <clears throat> the main thing was their offense, but still, I think that that matters because – Ultimately, you want to turn defense into offense, which brings me to number two, and that being the absence of Mitchell Robinson, which I think is very significant because you're talking about the fourth best player on this team after Julius Randle, R.J. Barrett, and Derrick Rose. You know what I mean? And this is somebody who's your defensive stalwart who, while he's not blocking as many shots as he was earlier in his career, he's still blocking a significant amount of shots and is one of the better shot blockers in the league. And on top of that is somebody who was starting to foul less. You know, his fouls have gone down each of the three seasons that he's played. And his presence in the series was missed because Trey Young would have thought twice about some of these floaters that he was able to, you know, so easily get to his spots to. And instead of rotating Nerlens Noel, Taj Gibson, you're talking about putting Mitchell Robinson in there for 25, 30 minutes a night and Nerlens Noel coming out and playing, you know, as a backup. And then you wouldn't have had so much Taj Gibson at the center. Uh, and that just changes how you would have played. And on both ends, because Mitchell Robinson also is a lob threat who has an offensive, who has a high offensive rating every season. His efficiency scoring around the rim is better than anyone else on that team. Like this is a significant loss that they had. And I would have been curious to see how he would have potentially, you know, maybe not swing the series entirely. But do I think having him there alone would have made you more competitive and win you an extra game or two? Yeah, that's entirely possible. Yeah. I think no, I think I think all that's fair. And I think for the reasons you said about Trey Young and how he would have thought twice about all the floaters, because you have to play differently when you had Nerlens Noel and Tosh Gibson on the floor. And look, the the Knicks have to improve in talent. They've got to get better offensively. Uh that's that's definitely key. They've got to add more shooting. They've got to become more, they gotta become more dynamic. Uh Brian has talked to, and I've talked about this. I think Lonzo Ball would be a good addition for them this offseason Perfect if they can addition. get. I think you got to see what you can do in terms of uh, with the draft picks, Knicks of 19 and 21. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. There's a lot that can happen. But look, you don't got to jump to the future. There were fans. I will say this. Walking out the garden last night, and I'm, I'm, I'm going down outside to the street, and uh, there were some fans chanting, we want Dame Lillard. Uh, there was a lot of chanting of that. Uh, there was then ridiculous chanting of we want Luka Doncic, which is not going to happen. Uh, but fans were doing that as well, too. So, so there, yeah, there's a lot of fans thinking about making the trade. And I think, you know, the Knicks have to be cautious on not making a move just to make the move and making the right move. And there's going to be a lot of questions, but, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see what happens. But for now, it's OK to say that the Knicks season was actually a good season and yeah. one that many people can enjoy. And we're going to do plenty of off-season stuff as it relates to that. Because I oh, do yeah. have some questions, but, you know, we can let that live because we're going to – shit, we're going to need to fill time in August. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. They're, they're definitely, We're definitely going to talk some off-season stuff. But, you know, for now, it, it's great. And there's a lot of other stuff going on with the NBA playoffs. But, you know, salute to the Knicks fans uh, last night, the fans that showed up at MSG for games one, two, and five. Uh, a lot of great energy. We're seeing the energy from people throughout the playoffs. A lot of fans seeing it in Brooklyn, seeing it in, in tons of different places, Memphis, LA. You're seeing it in different places. These fans are definitely – it's nice to have fans back in the building. It And having been a part of it, it's a good thing. But what's not nice – nice little segue here. Fans wilding out in these buildings. Fans not knowing how to act. I talked about this on the NBA Exchange recently. I had a little soliloquy on this. And – I'm not gonna. I'm gonna let you talk more, Brian, because I've already said enough of what I had to say. But I will say this, and there'll be more I have to say. It's getting out of control with these fans. We saw it again, even after it, a bunch had happened last week. Water bottle thrown at Kyrie. Monday, we see a fan run onto the court down in D.C. Uh, it, it, it's ridiculous. And I'll say, and I was blunt about what I said on the NBA Exchange, and I'll say it again. We ha- there's a commonality here. The fans that are doing this that are white and with the color of the players that are, have been in contact or have received direct abuse, whether it's John Morant's family uh, hearing you know, racial uh, threats and, and slurs thrown at them, whether it's Westbrook and the popcorn, Kyrie getting a water bottle thrown at, all the players are black. All the fans are white. And people don't want to talk about that dynamic. And some people want to both sides this, uh, like we saw from Jeff Goodman. Uh, do who I called out. It's ridiculous. And other media members have called out. 
Like, it's a joke. You're going to both sides and then delete your tweet like a coward and act like it never happened? Nah, son. Like, nah. We're not, no. We're not here for that. That has to stop. And I think people are, as I said, they're dancing around the racial dynamic, not calling it for what it is. And it's that these certain people, these certain white folks and fans with their privilege are showing that they don't care about the players in the court. Then you got the other folks that want to act. And this is the part I want to get into, especially with Kyrie, Brian. Well, this happened because Kyrie stepped on the logo. We're talking about a logo. A logo. We are talking about a logo. And somebody on Twitter, and I don't remember this guy's name, but he came up to me, it came to me and was like, oh, well, what if you're upset about both? What the fan did in the logo? And I was like, yeah, you're part of the problem too. Like, why do you care about the logo that much? It's just the logo. Like, the dude, and this is, the, I don't know what you think the solution is, Brian, but I think there has to be harsher penalties against these people that do this stuff, right? Like we saw in Boston with the guy, he gets hit with a felony charge, could face up to 10 years in prison. Now, I don't want to see the young man go to prison for 10 years or get some long sentence. I don't think that should happen, but I think there should be some kind of time and some kind, you can't assault people, you can't throw stuff at people, you can't throw popcorn at people. You can't do these things and not have there be there some repercussions because it'll make people think twice. But this was my point. Nobody cares about the damn logo. If you care about the damn logo, you're an idiot. Okay? You're an idiot. Right? Nobody, you know what? No, it's gonna, Kyrie's not going to get a felony charge for stepping on the logo because nobody cares. But this person throwing a water bottle at him will get a felony charge. And so if you're out here defending the logo and you're on some all logos matter shit, man, Get out of here with that nonsense. <laughs> Get out of here with that nonsense. <laughs> Nobody's trying to hear it. It's ridiculous. And you're just showing yourself in the fact that you don't care about the players. That's all I have to say. Tim McMahon from ESPN thought, uh, had to tweet it tonight. I, 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 I did where... <laughs> see this. I did see this and I loved it. I loved it. Where he said, due to concerns about half-court logos feelings, should the NBA consider moving opening tips elsewhere? <laughs> Which, like, see, that's my thing about the logo. It's like, who cares? All across the game, like, everyone's running across it a million times back and forth. Like, who gives a shit? You know what I mean? Like, I I understand. And and you know what? I kind of wish, I almost wish that Kyrie put a little more, a little more on that stomp. You know what I mean? Like, he was a little more deliberate Mm -hmm. in how he did it to just get people a little bit more mad. But, no, there's no place for throwing things at, the people who are performing on the court, who are athletes, who are, you know, again, people, which people are losing sight of. I think there's also something to what Kevin Durant and others have said, which is which is where my mind kind of went immediately, where it's like, yo, people have been locked up for so long or just restricted for so long. And, you know, now they go to these events and they're around people for the first time and they just don't know how to act. Like, this was an issue before. We've seen streaking. We've seen problems. Yeah, see, with- that's why I don't buy that. Like, I, I have yeah. a problem with that statement because I because I feel like you're letting these fans off the hook and their privilege off the no, hook. No, no, no. I don't, think, I don't think it's meant to come off, at least when I have read it from Durant and others, where I don't think it's meant to come off like they're trying to excuse the behavior. No, but it's I not- think. I think well, they're trying to ho- to highlight like, yo, this has been turned up because these motherfuckers just don't know how to act. And, you know, because they've been locked up for so long, it's like they have all this manic energy that they're trying to get off. They're just not doing it in a way that's obviously responsible. I think there's probably something to that, but that's, you know, still the reason said. I'm like, not the reason I'm not so sure about that. Right. Like, yeah. I'm not saying there can't be something to it. And I, when I said let him off the hook, I think we need to directly call out the fans and their privilege that are doing this. And I wish some players would do that. And that's why I say when I think people are sort of dancing around it, call them out. We know from before, Brian, we spoke about this on a podcast many moons ago, right? Remember we in Utah when the fan was saying the crazy stuff to Russell Westbrook, okay? Yeah. Fans have been doing this for time. Is there probably something that we've seen a bunch in a week or so because of the pandemic? And pe- Yeah, possibly. But I actually think that these people would have done this anyway because they don't care about the players. Like, let's just take it to the dude trying to spit on Trey Young, right? Yeah. Let's just go take isolate that one. Think about it. Spitting on somebody is literally the most disrespectful thing you could do. And you also have to be close enough to somebody to say that you're going to spit on them, right? And not you're basically saying, 
If you, it's just like slapping somebody. Brian and I, we've talked about this, right? Yeah. Thanks slapping somebody much. is really disrespectful because it's like, what you going to do? You right. ain't going to do nothing. Which I didn't I've even have the audacity. I've done a few times in my life. Yeah. I don't have... <laughs> I don't have I don't have the audacity to even throw a closed fist punch at you. I'm gonna just open hand slap you. Yep. That's how little I just you're gonna do, son. Somebody, if you spit on somebody, I feel like you have to be ready to fight, or you really believe that that person's not gonna fight you, or you also believe you're so protected that nothing would happen to you for the spitting on, right? Which is what I think happened with the dude at MSG trying to spit on Trey Young. He didn't think anybody was gonna, nothing was gonna happen. Nobody's gonna see it. Whatever, blah blah blah. Glad the cameras were all that happy. But this is, I think, this is the core of what these folks are. They would try this stuff anyway because they don't care about the players. We've seen people go in the stands before. Obviously, Mouse at the Palace is number one that people are gonna look at. Vernon Maxwell went to the stands because somebody talked about his uh, stillborn, stillborn child, which is wildly disrespectful. And you know what? I'm not saying Vernon Maxwell should have shown the dude the hands, but he should have shown the dude the hands, <laughs> right? Like that, like, come on, you talk about somebody stillborn child like that. I understand it. I'm not saying Russell Westbrook should have went into the stands when the person threw the popcorn on it, but I understood it. Marcus Smart, who we love for his toughness, remember at Texas Tech, Oklahoma when the fans State, says, yeah, Oklahoma State. Sorry. No, when when he was at Oklahoma State, but I think they, they were at Texas. They were Tech. playing Texas Tech. And the fan said something, and then Marcus Smart went into the stands, and the fans look. The fan looked like he didn't want any of that smoke. Right. Yeah. These fans he became my favorite player in that draft class. At that, I, I'm sure he did. <laughs> my point is, these fans. It's the entitlement that matters here, right? Like the entitlement matters here. These fans feel they're entitled, whether as I said, because of the color of their skin or the money in their pocket and where they're sitting, that nothing could happen to them. And we gotta call it. We gotta call it out. Because all of that in the proximity, they can just say whatever. We saw a couple years ago, West, Westbrook in Utah had somebody say something crazy to him. And somebody in Utah said something crazy to John Moran's family. I mean, is anybody shocked? No. And, it's, it, and you you know, it's the same kind of people who are repeat offenders and the same uh, kinds yep. of people who are on the receiving end of this. Because I'm not looking at J.J. Redick sort of getting heckled by anybody. You know what I mean? Like Luka Doncic even, he's not really getting it like that in that same mm-hmm. way. That's the interesting thing about it, which, I mean, not even interesting. It's just obvious. But I think that, again, like, it's it's a problem when these people feel so invincible and comfortable doing it. Yep. Because it's like, God forbid we get to the point where someone's able to sneak a weapon of any kind into one of these buildings. They're able to get through. And then, you know, who knows what could happen from there, right? Like, this can actually get really serious. Like, luckily, the dude who managed to get all the way down to the court in the Wizards playoff game just to apparently see if he can grab rim or some shit. I don't know what he was trying to do, that he got tackled by the security guard uh, football style. Like, thankfully, he just wanted to, like, do something that was really stupid and didn't necessarily harm anyone as much as it was pointless and stopped the game. And it did lead me to believe what was his end game there, which, you know, that's that's probably another discussion for another day because I can't seem to figure that one out. But at the same time, it's like, look at how far he got. Like, in other arenas, in Madison Square Garden, nobody's making it to the court. I mean, you and I have dealt with that security. As media. Yeah, yeah. You, you know you, what I mean? You're not. Like, yeah, you're not. Yeah. And, and, but in every, every but arena, there's, but there's still obviously, different. Yeah, yeah. Every arena. Like, so this is something that I think, unfortunately, like, I think it should start, obviously, immediately. I don't know what the, the NBA is going to do, but I think that that's, they're going to, you know, evaluate some things during the offseason and then you know, see how uh, their approach changes uh, next year. Because I do think that, you know, next year you're planning on having fans in the stands, full capacity right. and things of that nature. So it's like, all right, what, like, is there a next level to this? Hopefully not. And what's the NBA going to do to protect the players, which is the main thing? That is the main thing. And I, that's been my point on this. If you're not concerned about the safety of the players, show me you don't care about the players. And if you're more mad about a logo or – fan freedom of speech look fans come to the games you can say whatever you want for the most part right for the most part you want to say f this player whatever you want to say trey young is balding you want to get on a player's uh past performance i think that's all part of the game whatever when you start getting personal you start talking about people's family you start talking about their gender sexual orientation their color of their skin their race any of that stuff nah 
you got to get up out of there. And then when you start assaulting players, trying to spit, put hands in them and throw, no, no. Because what's going to happen is these fans that are doing this, it's all enticing. They're trying to start another malice in the palace. And what's going to happen is somebody's going to do the wrong thing. And the right, when I say the right player, I think you'll understand what I mean. The right player for the right situation to go in and show somebody the hands that doesn't want to see the hands is going to get the hands. And then they're going to learn today. And that's not the way they should have to learn. But I hate to say it, if nothing is done, as Brian is saying, to protect the players or more measures are put in place, stricter punishments against these fans that do this, then somebody's going to see those hands. And, you know, then it's going to look bad at the player and why the player do that. And it's like, yo, there's only so much to take. This is the thing I think people have to consider. And I've said this as somebody who's been an on-camera journalist out in the field. You know what's annoying? When people come and interrupt you or try to do things to interfere you in your place of work. Basketball players know the fans are trying to distract them when they're taking a shot. It's whatever. It's part of the game. But when you're leaving the court or your safety is in danger because somebody's trying to do something at your the place that you're working, that's annoying. As a person who's reported on camera, people try to come into my shot, yell stuff at me while I'm reporting, all stuff. I can say it's part of reporting, but there is a part of it that becomes annoying where it's like you're invading my space. We don't come to your job. And, and annoy you while you're doing your job. You know what I mean? Like most people, how can, can most of y'all handle that? Somebody coming right up on you while you're doing your job at your desk or whatever it is that you do? No, nah, it's not cool. It's just simply not cool. Respect people's space in the space that they're working. If it's all in the game, that's fine. But if you're going to try to assault people, that's it. This, this, there's no both sides of this, B. And for the people on this, it, either you're for the protection of the players or you're not. If you're not, you're telling on yourself. That's pretty much how I feel about it. If you're not about this, you're making excuses why this happened, you're telling on yourself and you don't care about the players. And look, white people out there, you know who's doing this. The white folks out there that care. Call out your Caucasian brothers and sisters that are wilding out on this and not seeming to care about these black and brown players. Call them out. It's okay. Backpack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind-the-scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. Naomi Osaka decided to pull out from the French Open. Uh, this after she cited mental health reasons for not wanting to participate in post-match press conferences. There's a lot of talk about this and why she did it. And then Osaka, you know, was clear about the fact that she was going through some things mentally and did not want to do these post-match pressers, but she didn't do one. And then she was fined $15,000 by uh, the French Open. But then all the federations came out and said, that's, you know, French Open, U.S. Open, Wimbledon, uh, Australian Open all came out and said, like, no, this, this, this is what we want. We expect all athletes to speak uh, after their matches and whatever. And it became this whole discussion on Twitter between, you know, whether athletes should have to speak against their matches, should, uh, is there more concern with their mental health and whatnot. Now, it seemed like the federations, Brian, had a pretty strong stance on this, and they weren't going to budge on this for whatever reason. They were like, look, if you don't show up, and do these post-match pressers, we're going to fine you. Um, and the fines could increase. It could even been up to $20,000. And Naomi Osaka basically was like, yeah, I'm not doing well right now, so I'm out. And she did. A lot of talk about that and what's been going on. How do you feel about her withdrawing? Should we care? I, well, I think the answer is obviously yes, we should care more about the mental health as athletes, but as we've also seen, people don't care about their physical safety. So... I'm not sure how much people care uh, about athletes in general uh, around, in terms of in terms of sports, but what do you take about? I, I'll call it a stance from Naomi Osaka. Maybe it's not really a stance. She did what was best for her mental health, and I fully support that. I do still think it's a stance, though. Right? Like, right. It could I, be both. I, I, I do still think it's a stance because 
you know, she, I mean, I heard, I heard Howard Bryant's, uh, Howard Bryant articulate as well on a uh, Levitard show. And, you know, cause they had talked about the same thing where he said like, you know, he obviously thinks that Naomi Osaka is obviously right in doing what she did. He just thinks that her second message should have been her first message. Cause her first message kind of tiptoed around, you know, what the second message ended up being. Because right. she was she was sort of like, all right, go ahead, find me, whatever. And, you know, when you find me, send it to, you know, a mental health clinic or whatever it was she said or something along those lines. Right. And she was it, it was almost it almost came off as taunting or whatever. But at the same time, I think the most important thing here is that, like, look. It goes to our, our point of what we just talked about last segment where these athletes are human, a big part that stuck out to me to what Naomi Osaka had said was that she had been sort of struggling with depression and things of that nature Mm -hmm. since beating Serena Williams in 2018 at the U S open. Right. And you're talking about somebody who is very young. Like I remember when I first learned about who she was, I think she was still 16 years old at the time. This was the U S open that you and I both worked at in 2016. Mm -hmm. And Ironically, I had discovered her through her interviews because I was looking through, I was a PA production assistant at the USTA and looking through, you know, everybody's interviews for interesting stuff that we could sort of use. And her interview stood out to me because she was just very normal in terms of uh, just compared to other athletes. It wasn't athlete speak. She was just like a normal sort of young girl. She was talking like in a very funny way just making me laugh because she was like just silly and regular and things of that nature. And that stood out and you've seen it. Like she's had other interviews where, you know, you can see how nervous she is and she'll, she'll talk about it, but then you'll get the jokes right after. And it's like, Oh, okay. So she must be fine. That's what people are left to assume. But she'll often say like, you know, she's nervous or whatever. You saw it after she won against Serena, how apologetic she was. And I think that was probably a turning point for her personally. She's had other interviews since where, you know, you, you'll see her talk about like her being uh, nervous or not knowing what to say or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that's something that I feel like all tennis fans know. Uh, And I'm not like a tennis fan or whatever. I'm sort of casual into that, but Naomi Osaka is one of the, one of the tennis players I follow. So I think that like people just assume, especially in this country that, millionaires are all okay multi 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 millionaires are all okay and you know money is not sort of you know the 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 point of you know just comfort for everybody in that same way she made a lot of money last year forbes reported it was in excess of 50 million 50 something million dollars off of endorsements alone which means it's entirely possible she made close to nine figures last year and yes you can still be depressed when you're that rich because like you know, the old saying goes, money can't buy you happiness necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think that there's something to that, even though I think it's some bullshit sometimes too, because it's like, yo, I mean, you know, being able to pay off rent would make people plenty happy, but that's no discussion for another day. But it's mainly to say like, yo, I think that we we need to really pay more attention to this. And I think that, you know, (laughs) if there were white athletes coming out and saying this, there would probably be more sympathy toward her. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Which is another issue. And I, you are going to need to speak more to this than me, but because you watch more tennis than I do, but I've at least heard, and I've only covered a few tennis events, that tennis journalists, tennis reporters are a special kind of um, aggressive as it, as it is compared to other sports. Like That's something that I've heard, which also sort of uh, led to this and you know other, other confrontational moments between players and reporters. I'll speak to this. I've seen a lot of aggressive reporting and probably never needed to be that serious in my career where I've always been about wondering why people are pushing so hard. Mm. There's a guy, I I won't say his name, but used to cover, I think he still does, around the Jets. And he would always just be extra aggressive. Players didn't like him. I know they didn't like him because I had players tell me this. Um... And I, I don't understand that. In, in tennis, um, uh, it's actually two reporters I can think about around around the Jets uh, that 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 were like this. They were mm. extra ag- ag- aggressive. I think one would be clear to everyone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the 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 other person I don't think many people would know as much. 
Um, but uh, I think that I, I think in terms of tennis, right? What I've seen is there's a lot of I would say maybe maybe some of it might be cultural. So I really want to be careful on what I say here. But I've seen a lot of it with the reporters who are international that are not from the states. Uh, with players who reside in the States, maybe be a little bit more aggressive or want to push for more questions uh, if a big time player has a loss. And, I, you know, and I think I've, I've seen that. But I think in press conferences, what people got to think about for athletes is in press conferences, you get a lot of dumbass questions. That's just the case of what it is. The best interviews you get, Brian knows this as a fellow reporter, is not even in scrums in the locker room. It's when you can go talk to a player one-on-one in the locker room, maybe get something off the record, maybe get some stuff on the record. Uh, sometimes even one-on-one by myself with somebody who's done video reporting with a camera where you're just talking with the player one-on-one. Uh, some of the best stuff I did around the Nets with Nets Daily was when I went and talked to different players, whether it was Marshawn Brooks or Jerry Stackhouse, and just talk to them one-on-one and just sit down and rap with them about stuff, you know, before and, and even on the camera. I think there's a lot of pressure on athletes to talk after they've had a match. I understand it's part of media. I understand it's part of promoting the game or sport or whatever it is. But that doesn't mean that everybody's equipped to do everything. Like everybody's not equipped to work in the same way. Some people deal with anxiety. Some people deal with are dealing with depression. Some people deal with social anxiety. We've seen this from other athletes. Derek Rose dealt with social anxiety. I've seen how he's gotten better at interviewing over the years. I don't know what steps he's taken to deal with that, whether it's been through seeing a therapist or whatever. We saw this from Ricky Williams back in the day. We've had players talk about it, but it kind of always, I think, Brian, you make a great point. It kind of gets brushed off, right, all the time where it's like, oh, well, you know, they've got money so they can deal with it. It'll be okay. And, you know, we have to ask ourselves, why is that? And as we talk more about mental health in society, I think we got to do a bit better job of looking at those who are privileged through wealth or access through sports, that they are humans too. But until we start thinking about, and oh, Brian, we're going to talk about this later, until we start thinking a bit more about how people are dealing with their mental health in terms of at mm. their jobs, yeah. until we start doing that and thinking about what's actually best for us as a society and people working what they're dealing with, we have to actually ask those questions yeah. and maybe be uncomfortable with some things about how we're doing in the past and being like, do we need to do this anymore? Yeah. And one question I wanted to end at least this segment on was uh, – so you start to see the discussion go around about like, do athletes still need to do press? Should they need to do press? And we've seen things, <clears throat> you know, go on, excuse me, from like, <clears throat> damn, Jesus Christ, I need some water. We've seen things go on for a while, right? Where things was just building towards athletes not really needing media in that same way, especially with social media and how, you know, much engagements, I guess I'm going to hurt myself for using that word uh you know athletes get as opposed to the organizations or reporters etc cetera, etc cetera, and they can control their own messaging by just talking to their fans simply there are still some athletes who do media and hmm, there are a lot of athletes who want to be in the media despite criticizing media but i'm wondering are we where, like where where does this go from here in terms of like the need for athletes to talk to the press because i feel like those requirements are still going to be there to a point and I feel like we're going to see them get stripped down little by little, or there will be workarounds to some degree. Evidently, tennis is not backing off from their stance, at least. The Grand Slams aren't. But, like, I don't know. Is there going to be a place where athletes are just not going to have to do media, generally speaking? Uh, I don't think we're going to get there. But I think the place that we need to get to is, can we get to a place where if somebody says, hey, I'm going through this at this time, and they go to a federation, they go to a league, and it's like, yeah, this time right now, I really can't talk to the media. And they're honest about it, whatever they're going through. Um, then is there going to be understanding for that? Listen, people need to understand there are going to be tough times in your life where it's going to be hard for you to do your job in a certain capacity. And what you hope at the place that you work is that they will give you the support you need to be able to do your job effectively while whatever it is that you're going through. You hope that you have support. Some people don't understand that. Some organizations still don't understand that because it's all about the dollar and the work. I think what we've learned from COVID-19 is like a lot of people, we'll get into this more a little bit later, a lot of people aren't caring about that as much. And I think it's made a lot of people realize, maybe including even Naomi Osaka, and I don't know her personal struggles, but maybe realize it's like, yo, at some point, like, 
there's more going on with me than this press conference right here. This is really inconsequential in terms of everything that's going on. This tennis match I might be looking at is inconsequential in terms of everything that's going on. And that's fine to feel that way. It doesn't mean you can't come back and then want to talk. You know, maybe she needs to deal with whatever she needs to deal with or deal with the things so she can be able to be better prepared for a press conference. But we need to start looking at, it's okay if somebody says they're not prepared to do something. If Naomi Osaka doesn't speak at the French Open or whatever Open it is, like, let's just ask ourselves, folks, is it the end of the world? It's not. She was still going to do the on-court uh, post-match talk. She was willing to do that. Yeah. She just didn't want to sit and do the pressers. And it's like, all right, well, you might not get the shots you want and stuff out of that. But she said that she was going through something personal. Now, where I agree with Howard Bryan is she could have been a little bit more clear on that. But I also want to give her the space and say it's probably difficult to talk about your personal struggles yep. so publicly. A at lot 23 of us don't, years old also. At 23 years old. A lot of us don't have to do that. It's very hard to do that. A lot of us, when we're going through stuff, don't come out and say, hey, everybody, I'm going through this. Most people aren't doing that. They keep it close to their chest. They Hopefully, you're not keeping it all in because that's not good. You're talking to some friends or family, that which is good, or you're going to talk to your therapist, which is also good. We hope that. But because she's such a public figure and the demands on her are different, th that might not actually be fair. Maybe we need to look at that. Maybe the demands on her shouldn't be so different. And we start looking at her as somebody who's working and going through something and is young, and we need to give her the space to figure it out in terms of mental health. We as society need to do a way better job in terms of being accepting of people's mental health and giving them the support they need to be healthy mentally. You would not do this if this was a physical injury. This is always my argument in terms of mental health, People or pe when people don't take it seriously. If Naomi Osaka had a leg injury and then couldn't be at the tournament or injured after the game and then said, hey, she couldn't make it to the press conference, nobody would find her. But when she's not mentally healthy or is going through stuff, now we're finding her? Like, that's, that, like, yeah. that's, like think about it. That doesn't make any sense. And, yeah. It literally doesn't make any sense. And one last point. And this is something else that Howard Bryan said in that same interview where, like, he just thinks that, you know, all these people are adults and they just kind of need to get in the room. And I kind of feel the same way. I think that I think that it's disappointing that the French Open seemingly didn't want to really cooperate with her on this, which also led her to this decision, which is something that we didn't really, you know, hear about. But, like, I feel like if the French Open wanted to cooperate with her, Naomi Osaka would have cooperated with them in some capacity. I agree. And I, think, and I think that people need to, like, when it comes to mental health and things of that nature, people need to, like, get together and work through it. Because if it's a mental health issue, it's not something that you're going to work through yourself. And you're going to need the people that you're then working with to work with you in that situation. So, I, I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. And I think, they, you know, the federations have said, all the, the tennis have said that they will come together and work out something in mental health. You know, they had like some BS statement release. We'll see what they do. Um, but I think actually this is a positive for sports and a positive for the sport of tennis. And Naomi Osaka, as Brian said, said taking a stance here um, and saying that like, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do what's best for myself. And I like how other players have supported her. And I think that's good. The people are going to win in the end. Like, like, I always believe that the people huh. fighting for what's right and being on the right side of history here in terms of mental health, they're going to win in the end. And we got to start caring about our athletes, not just in the physical, but in the mental as well. Now, speaking of the mental, not caring about the mental would be the NFL. We got a lot of talk on the NFL, whether it goes to concussions, other brain related injuries that have come into the sport. But yesterday, I was uh, headed somewhere, and my man Matthew Nelson, a uh, fan of the show, sends, tweeted at me a link to an article from the Associated Press. And the headline read, NFL vows to halt practice of uh, using lower cognitive baseline for black players in brain injury claims. Now, this, that headline I'm reading is actually from Yahoo Sports, an article written by uh, Jason Owens, but the, the AP one said uh, NFL vows to halt practice of race norming. Now, Brian, when I saw this, I was like, what? Race norming? What? Like, yeah. what is See, race norming? And I'm still unclear on this. You're going to be breaking it down to me. As All well. right. So I, I was, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up some notes too, but I was, I was kind of like, well, what's the practice of race norming, right? 
And the practice was regarding using different cognitive baselines for black players and non-black players when it came to brain injury, evaluating brain injury claims, okay? So basically what race norming is, there were, there were a bunch of players, as I said, we brought up the concussion issue over the years in the NFL. There have been players who've been filing lawsuits against the NFL saying that, look, they've had brain-related injuries due to play on, on the field, on the gridiron, right? The hitting of the heads, bodies colliding, all, all this stuff, right? We, we've, we've talked about this on this show plenty, right? But the practice of race norming, what that does, Ryan, is it assumes a lower cognitive baseline for black players. And it has been applied as the league considers claims in this $1 billion settlement, concussion settlement that they had settled uh, years ago. And now they've got to send all that, all that money out. So because of race norming, it basically says that it, it makes it harder for black players to show cognitive deficit in claims of dementia attributed to football-related concussions, right? But white players wouldn't have it as, as hard because basically what race norming does, it's already saying that black people mentally already op- operate at a lower level than white players do. Which when you think about this, right? When you just think about hearing that, and I read this, the only reaction to this is what the hell? And I could go with another stronger word if I wanted to there. Like, it, it was the only reaction. I'm like, really? And then I was like, the really shocked part of it for me, and I ended up tweeting this, was I kind of was shocked about this. But then when you think about the league that's involved, you're like, oh, no, I can see that because they have operated to show they don't necessarily care about black people uh, and black bodies. And they were kind of coming back to the same point we had before. And this, <laughs> the fact that the NFL has to come out and say they vow to not do this begs the question. Why were you okay with this in the first place? How were you okay with this in the first place? What information did you have to operate under this baseline? So there, basically in terms of this concussion settlement, <laughs> there was no equal opportunity. Like that's literally what it, what it is, what it comes down to is there's no equal opportunity. And then it also feeds into old stereotypes that black people do not have the same cognitive abilities as white people, which obviously it absolutely is ridiculous, but it feeds into that. And now this is costing people who played your sport, particularly black people who played your sport, money that they could receive in the settlement because it's going to be harder for them to prove based on this, this stuff that there's they have dementia or other brain related injuries. And I also want to know like who are the doctors that signed off on this? That's what I want to know. Right. That's that that that's that's what I want to see. I think there needs to be more answers. I don't think and I'm very intrigued to see how the media covers this and this includes all of us in talking about this. Hmm. Not just letting this go away. This is one that can't go away. This is one that there's got to be more investigative reporting on and I think there will be. Mm-hmm. More in depth reporting on, and I think there will be. Hopefully, I think the right people are going to push on this. Mm-hmm. This can't just go away and be like, "Oh, we now vow to not do this." No, the NFL needs to answer, and they have an answer for a lot of stuff all the time, and they don't just get to hide behind it. And this is why I think for some people, including me and Brian, it's been hard to go back and watch the NFL because there's still all these underlying issues that show they don't care about people that look like us. And I mean, case in point, there's no stronger real example than this like and these are for retired players so to me the nfl is a lot of explaining to do on this um you know there's there's a lot that's going on in which lawyers and some former players are talking about this but we're not hearing this about the uh nfl now the nfl did announce they're going to have a new evaluation plan how they're going to look at this (laughs) that has two women and three black doctors on a panel to propose new te- a new testing regime. And here's my thing with this, Brian. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. And that's, I guess, fine. But it seems to me like a dog and pony show, which we've seen with the NFL before, right? Let's yep. put these women up here. Let's put three black folks or doctors up here. And we'll show that we're diverse. And it's like, yo, but I still feel like the question needs to be asked. that. 
why was this going on in the first place? Mm-hmm. Like, it's, it's not enough to just he, he, sit here and say that you're making a change, okay? And, and, and what not. now they said that these replacement norms that they're going to do will be applied prospectively and retrospectively for those players who otherwise would have qualified for an award but for the application of race-based norms. And this was from NFL spokesman Brian McCarthy in a statement. But it's like, nah, man, you don't, like, can we stop with these organizations just pu- pushing diversity? Like, oh, we got three black doctors and we got, like, why weren't y'all doing this before? Why wasn't your, it tells me that your, your panel before wasn't diverse. Maybe it was all white doctors. And who were the doctors that came up with this? As I said before, I have a lot of questions. This upset me. It angered me as it should for everyone. But again, it might just be part part of the course for the NFL. I have literally nothing to add because it's just I just don't really have the energy for the NFL when it comes to a lot of this stuff. Because it's the same shit over and over and at which you basically touched on and I mean the dog and pony show, the we're gonna act like we're fixing an issue that we have that's scarce and not—I mean, they're not scarce. It's uh, very obvious, and we're not. And it's just—I just—I just don't really have a lot of words to add in terms of like how they're reacting to certain things or whatever, and the fact that this even manifested itself in the first place. So, you know, the NFL going NFL, right? We say clips going clip, NFL going NFL to us, I suppose. One time for your mind, got some interesting stuff to talk about this week. Uh, story for me, I don't think anybody would think I would talk about. Might have attributed more to Brian bringing this up, but I, I'll be bringing this up. But Brian has something <laughs> about people. Brian and I have had long conversations about what is going to be talked about here. And that's people returning to the office and going back to work now that more people get vaccinated and we are sort of moving towards a post-pandemic world. Uh, but Brian, what you got this week for one time for your mind? We had a long conversation, as you mentioned last week, you and I, <clears throat> excuse me, you and I did that basically d- detailed, you know, what are Americans going to do now that, uh, you know, they're being told to come back into the offices and make this money for the company so that management and the comp and the higher ups can profit off of it. And the working class could just, you know, give away the, the 15 hours of their lives that they had extra to work from home back in commuting and being in office. Right. So there have been more stories that I've seen recently. I saw one in, I want to say, The New Yorker a couple weeks ago. And I saw an opinion piece on NBC this week. And then yesterday, I saw a New York Post story, and they're all tied to the same thing, which is basically that a number of working class people in this country are quitting their jobs as opposed to going back into the offices. Now, you know, there are some people who can't afford, literally can't afford to to make this move, but it's something that I was very excited to see because, you know, I'm all about shaking the tree. And I'm all about the working class taking the power they have and exercising it because this country isn't shit without us, right? Like, a lot of people talk about, like, you know, these companies and, you know, they have, like, all the money or whatever, but that gets generated from the ground up. You know what I mean? Like, the only reason that the winds the 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 wheels are still spinning is because of this. So in the New York Post yesterday, I'll cite this one story, but you can check out all three and I encourage you to do so. Um the headline was these workers were asked to return to the office and they quit instead by Hannah Frischberg. Um and you know basically and I disagree with the lead. She says people are going broke over staying remote. How the fuck do you know that? Because some people have side jobs and shit of that nature. Right. You know what I mean? Like that's first of all, but you know, New York Post it is what it is. Um I just had it. A 33-year-old Georgia resident Portia Twit told Bloomberg of her decision to quit her job as a research compliance specialist last month after management began increasingly pushing her to go to in-person meetings at the office. In-person meetings for, for, for what? And now? Like, what? All right. Twit had taken the position in February because it was remote, but her inbox became full of requests that she attended various meetings in real life. Instead, she easily found a new job that allowed her to stay remote and quit her current job. And this was the money quote for me, Dex, where she says, they feel like 
we're not working if they can't see us. She said of her former bosses, mm. it's a mm. boomer power play. And that's mm-hmm. the point, Dex, that when we talked about this last week over the phone that you and I very much harped on because it's the same thing. It's it's people, it's boomers usually, but people who want to use that as a power play, like they don't believe that their workers are working unless they see them. And I'm not saying that the person-to-person contact isn't important, like, you know. Dexter and I miss doing the podcast in person and we are going to do some other stuff in person, you know, throughout the the summer and beyond and things of that nature. However, like there is a, an efficiency that we have now to be able to do this remotely that we didn't have before that was, you know, wrapped up in booking time for the studio, spending money for said booking time, commuting forth, commuting back, giving up an entire afternoon sometimes to record multiple episodes or whatever the case may be, where now it's like I could just pause my video game and go over here, set up for five minutes and then hit record and we can do it and you know in a way that's still high quality. And I think that there's an efficiency that people are now experiencing that they didn't have before more importantly a work-life balance and i do think that being you know for a lot of jobs you don't need to be in the office five days a week two to three fine fully remote even better five days a week it's not necessary especially as by the way crime is continuing to go up in all these cities right now because people don't know how to act yeah i think there's you know it's this is going to be a fight that i don't think is going away anytime soon because i think people I think that boomer generation, as was mentioned in the article, um, trying to make the power play, what, they, what they're going to have to realize is that sounds very overseer and slave-like, right? Yes. Like the mentality of like, if I can't see them, they're not working. T- tons of people have proven through this pandemic that they can work efficiently and remotely and also have a better quality of life. And like I said, I think the pandemic uh, has changed a lot for people in that regard and thinking about the quality of life that they want, the kind of jobs they want. I know it's done that for me. I can speak personally to that. There's certain things I don't want to do for work anymore that I have been doing where companies, et cetera, have been getting over. And I'm like, nah, we're not not doing that because I can see how I've had better things serve my life. You know, Brian mentioned the podcast and us doing a podcast. And I haven't seen Brian in person in (laughs) well over a year. We will see each other tomorrow. We have not seen each other in person for well over a year. And you know, yes, it was cool to do it in person and all this stuff, and we talk all the time, but Brian makes a great point about the efficiency that's allowed me time to fit more things in my schedule, around my family, that sort of thing. I think people who think that this there isn't going to be a shift here are dead wrong. There's going to be a shift in people working, working remotely. I think younger companies with younger leadership are going to get this. They're going to be on this. Progressive companies who have already started thinking about work-life balance for folks that truly care about their employees and their mental health, because this is all part of mental health. This is mental health related, for sure. They're going to be on this. But the ones that are stuck in the past, the ones that try to struggle and have younger workers, they're going to see more of this. You're going to see more people be like, nah, why am I doing this? I'm out. I'm going to go someplace where they value my mental health, where they value my space, my quality of life, my work-life balance. Like, and yo, either you're going to have to get with it or you're not. It's This is not, I want to be clear here. Nobody's saying they don't want to work. Pe- that's not what people are saying or fighting for. What people are saying is, yo, I don't necessarily need to be in the office as much. And I also want to say there is value to being in the office, seeing your coworkers, your team, connecting with them. Just don't need to do it five days a week. Yep. That's all. That's that's all people are saying. I, I, I don't. I don't. There's a value in seeing people. There's a value in connecting with your friends, the people you like. There's a value in being in sporting events again together. All that stuff matters. But we don't have to do it the same way we did it before when it comes to work. And look, companies that don't do it, they're not going to be able to attract people. As simple as that. Yep. These that- are the questions people are going to ask when they go in for interviews and stuff. Yeah. What's your work life balance like? What's the culture like? Is, yeah. is there remote options? These are this is going to be the standard now. So if you think it's not, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> good yeah. luck with that. That's re- that's something I'm definitely going to be asking about moving forward. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, if if certain opportunities arise and things of that nature, because it's like yo, like it, it's the same thing that I always go back to. Mm-hmm. This may sound really anarchist, but it's like yo, what are they going to do when we all walk out? Right. Like what? Like you could say what you want about this person's a boss, this person's editor here, this person, whatever. What are they going to do when their entire staff walks out? 
Right. I think they, I think they bank on the fact that, that they don't think everybody will walk out. But that's right. what they bank. That's what but the old system banks ex- on. Exactly. They just bank on there's enough people that need to, you know, pay rent. And, you know, I'm obviously sympathetic towards people in that situation. You got to do what you got to do and you got to do what you can to sort of get yourself into a better situation, too. Um, you know, and if that may entail walking out, then so be it. But I just think that in order for you as a company to get the best out of your employees, Yes, you have to accommodate to their work-life balance because it's much more efficient to, you know, wake up at eight, make breakfast or whatever, be available to work from nine to five. You mm-hmm. know, you have to do some you know, some house tasks along the way because you can fit that in that you then don't have to save for those two days that you're off every week so that you're wasting one week just doing chores the entire fucking day. Like, yeah, all that stuff matters. And instead of waking up at 6 a.m., eating breakfast, getting dressed, having to commute, whatever, you're not back at the crib until like 6. And even then, you got to settle down, change your clothes, whatever. If you have a family, God forbid, because now all of a sudden you're tied up with your kids for hours. You can't really do shit. You finally get some quiet time and it's like two hours and then you got to go to bed. Like, no, fuck that. Like, that's not going to work now. You know what I mean? And we're going in that direction. Like, that's what that's one of the things that I really hope from from the pandemic actually sticks is that working remote is something that is going to be a, a tool that we continue to utilize and even grow with. Uh, as we move forward, because for some people, they could just be remote all the time. For other people, it could be split. But in most cases, even for some doctors who are doing at home sessions and have been doing at home Zoom sessions or whatever, like mm-hmm. we talked about, uh, which, you know, my parents do one recently and it did go very well. Like, yo, for for most professions, yes, there there should be a couple of work from home days at least, especially like if you have a job where you're working at a real estate office where they're not wiring checks and they're fucking actually using paper checks to close deals instead of wiring shit over. So the administrative people and the managers actually have to report to the office four to five days a week. And that's fucking stupid. Yeah. It's, it's, it's time for a change. And I think undoubtedly people are, people are going to fight for this. And it's just like, either you're going to be with it or you're not, but those, those fighting and those with that old school overseer mentality, Ain't, ain't gonna win. All right, my one time frame mine. I'm gonna keep it real quick. Really interesting story I found uh, via the New York Post of uh, my former employer. And parents are enraged over masturbation videos for first graders. Yeah, this is at the Dalton School. Now, Dalton School is a very. Oh, we uh, competed against them in, in, in track and cross country in high school. In, in high school. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know Martin that. Martin Luther this... versus Dalton. We, they were in our conference in uh, cross country. Yeah. Except, and this might, you know, uh, the Dalton School and Brian School, let's just put it like this they're not in the same financial weight class. We were a public school masquerading as a private school. There's no chance. I mean, I only qualify because I'm an SSP kid, so we we didn't pay shit. You know, so that's a different story for another day. But no, now, Dalton, they're like college tuition. No joke. Yeah. Do, do you know how much the tuition is at Dalton? I want to say 30K, but it might be more now. That'd be nice. It's not. It's 55000 per year. Oh my 55 god! Fifty-five k for a year, high school. Right? That's like around Packer, Berkeley, Carroll. Like they're in that yeah, class. Yeah, they're they're in that class of schools here in New York City. When I went to Martin Luther, it was like seven thousand. But again, SSP kid, we didn't qualify for that, so I got in for a lot less. So I came across this article. And apparently, last fall, parents at the uh, Dalton School got wind of for their first graders being taught sex ed- education lessons that included masturbation. Now, I'm going to keep it real with everybody here. First grade? Yeah, first grade. So, obviously, that's intriguing that you have that response because I read this and I was like, okay, not terribly bothered, but I wanted to read more. So, I mean, so, it's a little early for me, I, but, you I, know. I, 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 need, I needed to, I needed to know, know more, right? And so, they have a health and wellness educator. Her name is Justine Angfante. And, you know, last month she led a controversial and explicit porn literacy workshop um, at another elite prep school where she teaches. And so there was like some stuff that went on where there's like a cartoon that uh, talks, shows the kids about like their private parts and touching themselves for pleasure. And um, yeah, it's, it's a cartoon. I'll, I'll read a quote from the cartoon. A quote from the cartoon is where a little boy in the cartoon says, hey, how come sometimes my penis gets big sometimes and points in the air. And then they explained that 
this is what an erection is. And, and the, the boy nods and says, yeah, sometimes I touch my penis because it feels good. And then the little girl chimes in and says, sometimes when I'm in my bath or when my mom puts me in bed, I like to touch my vulva too. Now, here's the thing. Here's, so this has become an outrage, right, guys? And parents were upset. Uh, you know, and here's, we also, this is the reason I brought up the money dynamics here. You got to understand the parents at this school paying $55,000 a year. They are kind of like some of these fans at these games. They feel very entitled. So they feel like I'm paying $55,000. I should know everything that's going on with my kids and what they're learning, blah, 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 and all this stuff. They Apparently in these classes, this isn't just the masturbation. They're also teaching kids about uh, their bodies to feel good about it, what's consent, what's not consent, things I think kids absolutely, absolutely should know, right? Like if somebody's touching them inappropriately, who they should talk to, what they should know, and all this stuff. So it's supposed to be like this sort of body awareness situation that the kids are learning, and they also learn about stuff about gender identity, et cetera, et cetera. And some of the parents are like, no, we're not here for this. Um, so there's a lot of complaints. Some other parents have said, yeah, we're not here for it, but you know, we just wish the school had informed us first about what's going on. Dalton pretty much has been like, They've reviewed their policies, their health curriculum, and I'm kind of paraquoting them here. And they they looked at age appropriate videos approved for students four years and older. The videos they uh, align with national recognized methodologies and standards, and they consistently review it. Blah blah blah. blah. And they're always going to respect everybody, looking at the best practices for all this stuff. Now Brian says, "Yo, it's a little bit too early." And my thing is like, look, what's, what's first grade? This one's six. You were six. You touched yourself. You was learning about your body on your own. Could have helped if some people gave you some more information on it in terms of body awareness and other things like that. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really have a problem with this, right? Like, I don't really have a problem with this. And I'm saying this as a, as a father of a child who will be in kindergarten and eventually in first grade to learn about, like, what's the holdup? Everybody, all these parents, I'm like, I, if, I wish I was at the school. I'll ask these parents, if it's some P, they hate me at a PTA meeting. What are y'all so mad about? <laughs> what are y'all so mad about? Do y'all masturbate? And, I mean, maybe they're prudish enough to be like, no. Did you was you touching yourself when you were a kid? You probably were. What's the big deal? The kids are learning about their bodies. It's not that. It's, why are we so Why are we so uptight about this in this country? Who cares? I I I don't want to sound uh uh but like I'm on. I don't want to sound like I'm on their side. <laughs> but of this, you are. I'm not. But I will say, like, six is kind of Why? early. Why? It's kind of Why? early. Because Why? I'm trying to think. I was not, like, not yet at six. Probably a little bit after is when I started. Probably, like, later on in the elementary school is when you started. Because you don't you don't know shit. Like, at six years old, Yo, at least why, at that point. At least why, at that point. Why is thought, it a problem to know something earlier? That's all I'm saying. I, I don't what's know. The, like, what's that, the danger? What's the danger of learning about that at six? That's my question. I think what the parents are thinking in their minds, aside from the other stuff you laid out, I'm going to stay away from that because you're right about all that. Uh, I think what the parents are thinking of, like, I think they just want the kids to be kids for as long as possible, which I don't know what that's like in this age. I know that when I was a kid, I thought that girls were icky for a while. You know what I'm saying? Until, like, the first girl that I probably liked outside of uh, Felicia, who gave me my first kiss when I was like six years old uh, by the monkey bars. That was pretty cool. Uh, shout out to I Felicia. But like, other than that, right, I want to say the first girl that I liked in school, I was in second grade, making me seven, eight years old. But I didn't know much about. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> hold on. So you were seven, eight years old, and these kids are learning right before they're going to hit that stage. They try to get them ready. No, no, no. I'm, sa- I'm not like I'm saying. I'm just trying to give you what I think the parents' explanation is. So, like, while it sounds early, it's also to your point. It's like, I mean, what's the big deal if, like, for me, it's you know. It was it was a year too soon. Now I do remember. Um, yeah, and you probably yeah. There's probably I could probably point to you from second grade on that there was probably a girl that I liked every single year after, but I didn't know what sex was. I will say that much. Like I didn't know shit about that until probably like uh, middle school, maybe. But you know not, what I mean. But but you're teaching them. And when I even... found out, listen, 
They're not even learning out, about sex, though. They're just uh, learning about their body parts. No, I know that, but I'm just saying when I found out, it, like once you once you learn what that shit is, like okay, in Hidalgo Heights, I'm gonna say this: in Hidalgo Heights, there oh. are a couple conversations about porn, but to, amongst the amongst the kids, they're teenagers. I'm here to say that's something that we were doing in middle school. We were right. talking about Daphne Rosen and 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 fucking <laughs> Gina Michaels and Savannah Gold and you know uh, and Alicia Tyler, rest in peace. Like this was something that we were talking about when we was in like seventh or eighth grade. You know what I'm saying? Like that's just part my, of the game. My my so. thing is, you're not asking the kids. I think I think what's underlying there is Genevieve make- Jolie. Shout out to the Queen. You know what I'm saying? People. People Mexican make the, porn legend. People make the correlation that, okay, if you start kids learning about sex education earlier, that then this, they're going to be increased to have or at a greater chance of having sex. And it's like, no. And I think the thing that you bring a point about is kids now, because of, of the internet and access to tablets and all stuff, they see more signs of intimacy than we probably even realize right like we in this country we love to like sell sex and then like try to act like we're repressed from it and act like it doesn't exist right and again this isn't even about sex this is kids about identifying their body parts and look from the time you're young kids are understand like what body parts are what the differences are they they, they might touch it you know like it's not that crazy like i don't think any of this is crazy i think the people up there the dalton school the parents there stop being prudes Stop being prudes, man. Stop being prudes. You don't have to do this. And this is not going to affect your kids so negatively because they learned a little bit about their body parts, uh, gender identity, masturbation, all stuff that they're going to learn anyway. They're six years old. You know what I'm saying? We have kids watch worse. We have Some kids are watching violent movies out there and you're worried about this class? Come on. That's it. All right. That's the most we've ever talked about uh, body parts here on One Time for Your Mind and the Ain't Hard to Sell podcast. I, I, actually, I don't know about that. That, that, might, that, that might not be true. That, <laughs> that might not be true. We also once had a discussion about peeing, sitting up, or standing down, how you wipe. Listen, we've had all, listen, all sorts of... Uh, all, we, had, we, we had a conversation about a place called Uba Duba. we had all kinds of crazy all, conversations. All, I, all I'm going to say, Chapter 2 Hidalgo Heights is named after Tiana Trump, and there's a reason for that. And oh, I will leave man. it there. Of course, there you go. You you got to that early. You got to that early. <laughs> like like this, like the lady trying to teach these kids is doing. She's trying to get to them early. That's all she's trying to do. That's it for this episode of the Hard to Tell podcast, episode one eighty. Uh, we dropped later this week because we had a lot going on. We will be back with you early next week. Uh, we'll have a lot to talk about. A lot going on in the world of sports. NBA playoffs are continuing. Uh, baseball starting to heat up a little bit. So a lot to talk about. Uh, hopefully, we get some more stuff in hip hop. Roland, we should have a good hip hop guest joining us uh, pretty soon in a couple weeks as well, too. We'll so, talk about the Jay Z and Nas song on the DMX album uh, next episode. Yes, we'll have to talk about that next episode. So, for Brian Fonseca, I'm Dexter Henry. And until next time, y'all, Choo. peace. <laughs>